Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the heliosphere of our solar system. The region that's produced by our sun as it travels across the galaxy and as it sort of interacts with a lot of different plasma out there outside of our own solar system. But specifically we're actually going to be talking about this right here. The actual representation of the heliosphere as it was recently recreated by using one of the most amazing satellites that is currently orbiting our own planet. The satellite that you see right here known as IBEX. But let's talk a little bit more about what we know about the heliosphere and also how all of this was discovered because the actual method here is sort of mind-blowing. First of all, you can learn more about IBEX using the link in the description below. This is a satellite that has been operating for over a decade now and has produced quite a lot of data. And the satellite itself is in a very interesting orbit around our planet where it can sort of detect a lot of different things coming from the heliosphere and is specifically looking for what's known as neutral hydrogen. This neutral hydrogen, or ENA as it's known, which stands for energetic neutral atom, is produced by the helio sheath that you see right there. Or in other words, it's produced around this region. Now the way that it's produced is when the emissions from our sun, specifically very highly energized emissions, collide with the plasma of the interstellar space and start creating the neutral hydrogen atoms that sometimes return back to the inner solar system. Now in the past we've already discovered there are a lot of really interesting things happening in this helio sheath, which is this region right here, right between the heliosphere and the interstellar space. And at this region, because of the pressure from the solar wind, it kind of creates a very thick and somewhat dense region of very active plasma. This has been detected by the Voyager probes as they traveled away from the solar system and they discovered that there's a lot of really energetic activity going on here including some really interesting formations that sort of form these unusual bubble-like structures inside this region. And so by being able to identify where this region is around the sun we're able to kind of create a three-dimensional map that allows us to define the heliosphere of our solar system. Now if you're still confused about the heliosphere and what it represents in the solar system I think the easiest analogy is using a sink and a running water here. If we look at what all of this looks like, with the sun being represented by the point where the tap water hits the sink, you've probably seen that there's a kind of a fast flow in this region and then there is a lot of slow flow past that. Now this obviously represents the interstellar space and the helio sheath including the termination shock is the region right between the fast flow and the slow flow with the fast running water right here representing the solar emissions and various types of solar flares coming from our sun as it bombards the rest of the solar system using its energy. And so once you understand the analogy, it sort of starts making sense in terms of uh, the solar system as well, except that instead of water, here we're talking about various emissions of plasma, specifically ionized hydrogen and of course electrons as well. Something that we usually refer to as the solar wind. But something interesting happens when the solar wind hits the helio sheath, or essentially the limit of the heliosphere. It converts some of the charged particles into neutral particles, and those neutral particles then make their way back into the solar system. Hypothetically, we can detect them and using this calculate, or at least predict, an overall shape of the helio sheath and the heliosphere. If we go back to this analogy, we're essentially detecting some of the water particles that then bounce off the termination shock or the helio sheath and slowly move back to the region where we're located where we can kind of see them. And then if we're somehow able to time the return journey of these particles, we should be able to calculate or to at least build the image of what this entire region might actually look like, which is precisely what the scientists were able to do by using IBEX. By using approximately 10 years of data between 2009 and 2019 and observations from the solar activity, and then by collecting the data of the returning neutral particles, the scientists were able to then work out how long it took for particles from different directions to make their way back to planet Earth. And essentially this way they were able to work out the overall structure of the helio sheath. Another way of looking at this is echolocation. And so just like bats use echolocation to map a cave, for example, by orbiting around planet Earth and by collecting the data from these neutral particles, IBEX was able to map the entire region in three dimensions around our planet. 
which of course by association meant that it was able to map the region of the solar system as well. And it created this image by dividing the region into 56 macropixels, which more or less covered the entire three dimensions around the sky. And by combining the 10 years of data, they were able to create this. So this is right now the best representation in three dimensions of what the heliosphere of our solar system sort of looks like. Now obviously because it only used 56 pixels, it's not a very accurate or a very precise representation, but chances are it will only get better with time as we collect more and more data. And because this is the first time that it's ever been done this way and the first time that such a 3D map was created, this of course is just the beginning and chances are that in a few years from now, we'll have something as beautiful and as detailed as this illustration you see right here, but in three dimensions. Now the way that they essentially made this work is by observing the increases in intensity coming from a typical solar flare. So for example, let's just say a major solar flare occurred and was detected on planet Earth. The scientists then have to wait a few years before the solar flare interacts with the helio sheath and starts returning these neutral particles to our planet again. And then after a couple of years, if they start detecting the increase in neutral particles coming from a certain direction, it means that the solar flare has just bounced off from the helio sheath and is now coming back to planet Earth. And so far, according to this technique, it looks like the minimal distance to the helio sheath from our planet, which is this right here, is roughly around 120 astronomical units, which is about four times the distance of Pluto to the Sun, or around 30 times the distance to Jupiter from Earth when it's closest to planet Earth. But on the opposite side, it seems to extend to over 350 astronomical units, which already means that it's at least three times away as far away, but chances are even farther because it sort of represents the limit of this particular technique. It's almost impossible for the scientists to try to use the echolocation at farther distances in this direction right here. And so it's not really clear how long the actual tail extends to. And so the heliosphere on this side could actually be extending way farther than we sort of imagine right now. But the distance of 120 AU is exactly the same distance where Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were experiencing these unusual observations that we now refer to as the heliosheath. Although to be more exact, it was actually a distance of about 119 and 121. And because of this, we know that this region is not very smooth. It's very likely extremely bumpy. And it's probably also filled with a lot of different turbulence and a lot of different activity we still don't really understand. But because this technique proved to be quite successful at creating these maps, and because IBEX is still operational and usually detects about 500 different neutral particles per day, there's a huge chance that in the next decade, if it's still operational, the map might increase in quality and of course increase in resolution. What started as 56 pixels, which is what you see right here, might increase to hundreds, thousands, and possibly even millions of pixels. And this of course means that we might create a map showing us an extremely detailed picture of what the entire solar system and the heliosphere actually looks like. For now though, because of the current limitations in resolution, this is the best we can do. Although even this is already quite impressive. But anyway, it's always great to learn more details about our sun and our solar system and discover new details or see new maps that we've never seen before. So I'm sure there will be more follow-ups to the study and more maps coming in the next few years. Until then though, check out all of the relevant links and the study I mentioned in the description below. Subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves to learn about space and sciences and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.